Wanna come up? Hi guys and welcome back to another episode of Job and the Librarians. This is season two, episode seven. And today we're going to talk about um, Sisters of Snow by Margaret Dilloway. My name is Erica. I am a young adult librarian. Hi, I'm Lauren and I'm a reference librarian. Um, we're going to jump into this, as Erica said, we're going to jump into the book uh, Sisters of Hard and Snow by Margaret Dilloway. Um, I actually did a little reading on her before, you know, before we got here, Erica and I were discussing that a little bit before we came in. Um, you know, I had looked at a couple things before we started reading, um, got into the reviews again, and one of the big complaints among the reviews was that there's essentially a story within the story, which generally I don't care if there's a story in a story. Um, they do that in Hamlet at one point. And it was actually kind of cool to see in Hamlet. Um, not as cool to see in this one, um, at least in my opinion and the opinion of reviews on Goodreads. This is one of those moments where when I read this stuff on Goodreads, I'm like, okay, let's see how this goes before anything else happens. Um, my big problem with the story within the story was that it didn't seem to tie into the book. Um, they kept refer the way that it gets introduced is they talk about a book that their mother mentions to them. And there's a whole backstory to this book. And there's this whole backstory to their mother that they don't know. Um, and their names are, oh, good gravy, Drew and Rachel. Rachel. I kept wanting to say Rachel, but it felt wrong. Um, there's this whole backstory to their mother that Drew and Rachel don't know. And they end up learning their mother's backstory because of this book. But it keeps flipping between Drew's perspective and Rachel's perspective, which I was fine with. And then into this third story, which is 12th century Japan. and that didn't seem to tie into Drew and Rachel's perspectives or life or what was going on with their mother. And at least for most of the story. And it also, from what I found out after reading, she wrote the book, Margaret Dilloway wrote this book. She wrote obviously sisters of heart and snow included the bits about 12th century Japan with this female samurai, which sounds amazing. And then basically took that stuff and then made it made a full new book about this 12th century female samurai where she wrote that book. And it's just like, if you're going to write that book, why don't you just have them reference reference the book here? You don't need to in, input parts of that story in here because it's, you know, it's them taking the book to be translated there. You know, you can say, oh, we found time to read the book and mom, what? What's up with this book? No, like that's all you really need. That's essentially what they did in um, a Rainbow Row book, Fangirl. She references this book and then all the fans wanted to know more about the book. And so then she made the, you know, the book that she had referenced and basically wrote that. And I feel like you could have done that here very easily. Yeah, I uh, totally agree with you because I felt like the reason that was like one of the main reasons why I didn't really enjoy the book as, as much is because it was telling two different storylines in one. They didn't tie together. Also, I felt, in my opinion, that it was just so slow getting into and a different alternating between different perspectives. Normally, I like that, but with this case, I didn't because oftentimes it would just jump from different perspectives very fast, and you could easily be like, okay, wait a minute who's talking now and it's just was so much um also it went through a lot of problems with um the girls growing up they had a very mental not mentally um yeah mentally emotionally their, their like, mom never stood up for them and it was she was just complacent and just there existing and especially when the girls needed her and so that caused them to act out a certain way and do certain and things separate that, themselves right and so they just all went a totally different direction and that's where the events are from now also there were a lot of flashbacks within the when the sisters were telling um each other's story one night like 
some like they would do a certain thing and then they would go back and like okay this is what happened when this is the reason why i'm not like this because of my father and other stuff like that i just feel like it was so much of that going on that it was losing the main focus of the story see i didn't mind how slow it worked into things and part of that was it's them trying to investigate their mother's background before coming here and i felt like that needed to take a little time and i also didn't mind the flashbacks because in uh, in big part because you've got rachel and drew in in these moments and in in, in real life you're going to have moments where you don't remember something or don't realize something until you're in a very similar moment later um so that felt real to me um but I also, but also some of those flashback things were them like talking to each other. No, I don't like that because after you left or before you, you know, you probably don't remember this, but dad did X, Y, and Z. Like, yeah, I, I kind of followed that and I didn't mind it. Um, but I, I see what you're getting, like saying if you're not, and I mean, normally what drives me nuts in books is how if they move slowly and you don't feel like anything's happening. To me, I thought that bit worked for that this book, um, as weird as that sounds. Yeah, and it's a contemporary. So, I mean, I'm not really, I wasn't really expecting it. It wasn't, most of the time when I read contemporary, is totally different from this. This is a historical contemporary, so it, it has to give you those backstories, especially with the 12th century retelling and everything. But it's just... It wasn't what I was used to reading. Maybe that's just it. The and weird thing is, is with, it's historical, it's contemporary, and it's historical. You mute it. It's it. Sorry, it's it's historical and it's contemporary, but it's like it's not historical. I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. Basically, the historical part is the 12th century Japan. And which is stuff that really should not have been in this book. Um, primarily, you're dealing with Rachel's perspective, and then like the next chapter will be Drew's perspective. I mean, at least it follows a very linear pattern of who, you know, it's modern, modern 12th century Japan. It's not, you don't always start with Rachel, you don't always start with Drew, or you don't always finish with Rachel, and you don't always finish with Drew, like in terms of where they hit before the. 12th century Japan, but it's very much of you get one current perspective, a second current perspective, the 12th century perspective. Um, and on some level, the 12th century perspective might have been necessary just to break up all of that. But I mean, the third perspective was just so unnecessary, especially with it being. 800 years before 800 900 years before that it, it didn't it didn't hold water in terms of in terms of this yeah i feel like something else could have been in place of that because it just didn't really go with the storyline or it, it found another way to kind of intertwine them because of the girls relationships with each other i could see maybe using this storyline um to kind of find a way for the for them to get back together as a family because technically it's just them two well but and the cool thing is in a way that they they did because drew only knew rachel's kids for like half an hour at christmas and she ends up moving in with the family for a couple months as they're investigating so it's rachel and drew kind of reconnecting as sisters and Drew reconnecting with her niece and nephew, she goes and actually sees her mom, which it didn't seem like she did a ton of beforehand because she kind of looked down on her mother beforehand as a housewife, as somebody that only quilted that was kind of unavailable. I don't think she meant to be unavailable. I think, you know, I think her way of coping was, you know, she's got to let the husband do what he does. And she goes in quilts to kind of try to make things feel better. And she makes a quote for her grandkids and her daughter's wedding. And that said, 
no, she didn't stand up for her kids when they needed her, which sucked so much. She did, however, sneak out. Even granted, the husband admitted towards the end that he knew his wife snuck out to see the kid he disowned and kicked out. But she snuck out to like actually be part of her daughter's life and to know her grandkids. So on some level, she did something so that way she doesn't lose her family. Yeah, and then that's another thing. She really didn't know because of the way her and her husband got together. What did bride for? What was it called? She was a mail order. She was a mail order bride, essentially. Right. So she was just ordered, basically, just to get away from her situation. Well, and but, but that said, her situation and my understanding of Japanese culture, which is about this big, um, in a lot of Asian cultures, the for a long time, I don't know how it is currently because, you know, it's the 21st century and things change everywhere. For a long time, the female, was, and this is even into like the 20th century, again, according to my understanding, the female was supposed to be submissive to the husband, which you do see with the mom in this book. She, and so in terms of that, I think it rang true. And you, but also according to her customs, you find out that she got pregnant young and unmarried, which is a big no no over there. And because of that, she was soil goods and nobody in her town, her county, country, country, whatever, you know, basically would touch her. So she becomes a mail order bride. And it turns out this crazy bastard of a man sees her picture and is literally the only American or only person perusing this catalog that even shows any interest in her. And so that's how she ended up being mail ordered to this. Yeah. Cause he um, didn't even want her to go out with the girls to like, to do play dates or anything like that. He was just a very mean and hateful, prideful person that was so mentally abusive and because she was so dependent on him it just being so dependent on him diminished her relationship with her daughters because she was she needed him basically to have a roof over her head she did and the weird thing is there was an episode like this in elementary um, where somebody was essentially where in the elementary is the show about Sherlock Holmes that takes in takes place in New York City with uh, Johnny. Lee. Oh, it's a great show, right? Yes. But there's an episode like this in that show where this professor had ended up in Asia and had so had met this girl kept promising that he would marry her and brought her to the States and in the States would tell everybody that she was his wife and he convinced her to do the same thing. And so they legally were not a couple, but because they were telling everybody this and nobody fact checked it, she was able to get all the benefits, but he, but she didn't have a green card. She didn't have anything. So if he decided to dump her, um, she would be sent back to China or Japan or wherever she came from. Um, and in some ways that sounded like a very similar situation to the mother and father in this book. Yeah. It, yeah, it was just, it was very, very crazy. I, I do like how at the end though, how the sisters did come together and kind of, you know, got rid of what they were going through in a sense. But it's just all all the way around. I'm just it was just a story that a nice contemporary with a little bit of history thrown in, and that's basically what it was to me. <laughs> well, like I said, she wrote this. Uh, she wrote a second. Uh, I should say a second book. This is, I think is like her second or third book, and she wrote another one. Um, that is the Asian story. Um, is the female samurai story. And I think that could actually be an awesome story um, in reading it. I just hope they don't put contemporary shit in it. And right. I mean, it's just like, you know. I, like, I mean, like, even though I thought this storyline wasn't 
this needed in this. I liked it just a tad bit more than I like the sisters storyline. See, the weird thing for me is in this book, I liked the sisters storyline more than I liked the Japanese storyline. Um, and I say that because the story I signed up for this one was the sisters. So I'm, you know, I felt more, I mean, this could just be like, because I had a, my grandmother had dementia. And so I was, to me, this, discussing the dementia seemed real ish, not fully real, but like it was a good portrayal of it. It was a good portrayal of a family attempting to uh, deal with a family member who had had that issue. But it was just, you know, for me, it was one of those things where in in the story about Tomo, Tomoi, to, the female the female samurai, and I realized that at one point in the story, they tell you that it's not a female samurai because sam samurai by itself is supposed to be male. And there's another word for it, but I forget the word and I most likely could not pronounce it anyways. But that... Um, to me, there is a part in reading this book. I'm like, why is this historical shit in here? And then I'm like, but I want to read that book. And I'm like, I just hope they don't put contemporary shit in that book. Yeah, because that contemporary and that I just feel like it was just not needed at all. Those two did not go well together whatsoever. They didn't. I mean, I get on some level that the book was necessary in order to bring the sisters back together. And to get them to investigate their mother's life before she came to America. But they didn't need to go into the story within the book. You know, they could have yeah. easily referenced that. That said, the I found out that the name of the book, if anybody's interested, it, that she wrote that's got the story of Tomo that in its full form is called Tale of the Warrior Geisha. And I mean, she's got some other books. And I mean, like I said, that sounds interesting to me. But I really want to read The Care and Handling of Roses and Thorns, which she also wrote, and How to Be an American Housewife, which also, which is actually the book that came out before this. And it's, you know, if you're looking at the cover of the book, like right up here at the top, that's the one that they mentioned before. Yeah, I see a lot of people talking about that one. And this book wasn't really anybody's favorite out of all the ones that she read and like Lauren said at the beginning is mostly about the two different storylines within it but um her other ones do sound interesting like I said I've never really read anything like this and mostly of the contemporary that I read is mostly new adult so this was again stepping out of my comfort zone with a different type of book but I gave it two stars um because it just the the two storyline kind of basically turned me off with it. And yeah, how long it took me to get into it. Yeah, and the weird thing is, I don't read a lot of contemporary. I tend to read mystery, biography, nonfiction, historical fiction. Like, and so for in, I I'm not even gonna lie. I recommended this book, and I know a lot of times when I recommend the books, they end up being like everybody else like hates them, and I'm like that actually wasn't bad, and. I promise I'm not saying it wasn't bad because it was my book. Um, but me and me recommending this book um, in terms of Java and the librarians, we're always like, we're trying to find stuff that we don't normally read. And we hadn't read anything in this group to my knowledge with an Asian bent to it, which this book has. And we, and I, I mean, since I don't read a ton of contemporary and as Erica says, she doesn't read a ton of, adult contemporary per se it seemed like a good just kind of cross section of just stuff that we had you know should have been doing yeah and like i said it sounded it sounded good it doesn't really talk about in the synopsis about the other storyline but it sounded good yeah it not good, at all it, it didn't say anything it has a good premise it has you know it sounded good but when you open the book and you see, because it started off with the other storyline, and it, it just, in a nutshell, it just basically turns you off from the rest of the story. For me, it just wasn't. Yeah, good. and I'm not gonna lie, Unless there were something else. 
Like, yeah, she could have just that, that story by itself, and then the sisters by itself. But I just yeah. don't see where she needed that in there. Yeah. Um. But that's I think part of the reason I was able to enjoy what I did is I had chunks of the 12th century stuff where I'm like, I need to skip you in order to deal with this book. And I mean, I, in terms of the 12th century stuff, I either skipped it or I glazed over, to be honest, um, just because it was that unnecessary to the storyline. Yeah, I did the same thing and a little bit with the sisters, because like I said, it was so repetitive with some stuff. And I, was I like, did okay, a lot more than I did a lot of like harder reading with the sister stuff just because it's stuff that, you know, I, you know, was the storyline was supposed to happen. Though I will say this, there were a couple things that I did also want to mention with this. Um, the, if I can find that. Well, the first is the book actually started with some, if I can get there. It actually started with a couple interesting quotes. I, I own a copy. That's why I able to get my hands on it. Um, it's got a couple quotes from, I think, uh, people that have done stuff in Japan. The first is, why did you vanish into empty sky even when the fragile snow, when it falls, falls in this world? And that's from Izumi Shikibu, who was alive from circa 974 through 1034. Um, and, I mean, basically... I mean, to me, that's a good quote for the book because, I mean, the sisters kind of dis disappeared out of each other's lives for such a long time. And the other mm -hmm. one, which goes more along with the 12th century Japan story, some war uh, some warriors look fierce, but some are mild. Some seem timid, but are vicious. Look beyond appearances. Position yourself for the advantage by Den Ming Dao. And I thought that, you know, I, I thought those were good quotes. Like, I like them. Um, let me see if I can find the other thing that I wanted to show everybody. Oh, here we go. There was also some... Is there another one in here? Sorry, I realize I should have marked this, but I think there's another one, but I'm going to hold this up. But oh, yeah, if <laughs> the art in here is like there's a couple pictures and they're just these 12th century Japanese type of things or 18th century or something. And I thought those were cool. I mean, even if they didn't include the 12th century Japan stories, I I'm glad that the, whether that was included or not, I'm glad that they had the pictures in there because yeah, they're investigating their roots. So they might as well have a couple of those pictures to like help propel the story. Yeah, I like those um, that they incorporated those in there as well. I didn't really annotate um, this story. I bought it from Kindle, but there was one quote that I'm trying to find and I can't. But the dad says it, and I think it's mentioned a couple of times. The dad says it, and I just cannot remember. Whereas he told her when he kicked her out at sixteen. Yeah, there's a Japanese line, which is essentially, you only get one life to live, don't screw it up, or something like that. Yeah. And that was marked a lot, and it was mentioned a lot. But yeah, he kicked her out um, when she was 16, basically. She just, you know, she was on the swim team, and she dislocated her shoulder, and she couldn't swim anymore, and so... um she gained weight. She lost a lot of friends. She just isolated herself. And her dad was only interested in her when she was being active and um, just being proud of her during that moment, but not because simply that she's his daughter. And so she would get into trouble. And the last straw was when um, she was doing drugs. And he basically kicked her out at 16, told he didn't want to see her anymore and all the other stuff. And the mom, that was the first time the mom kind of sort of stood up just a little bit she didn't tell him not to kick her out but she told him to let her stay at least until morning but it's not still not taken up but she just stood up to him just a little bit that's like that's the first time you saw her say something back to him that she didn't agree with yeah and, but i also have to give the family her the girl rachel's friends parents a lot of credit because 
the friend invited Rachel over and the parents were like, yeah, she can stay for a couple of nights. And as she's staying and they're talking to her, they realize that she'd been kicked out. And they're like, look, you can stay here. You can finish school. We will help you. And basically took her in. So she just didn't become nothing afterwards. Yeah. It kind of broke my heart a little bit when it said that um, her friend's mom had died, had passed away. This is so she was everything that Rachel wanted her mom to be. Yeah, and the thing is, I don't I don't think her mom could have been what she needed. Um, unfortunately. She tried. I mean, I, I feel like there were moments that she tried to be like supportive in the swimming thing and to understand what she was going through. But I don't think that's what she had and what she had been taught to be as a wife and a parent. And it's unfortunate. And because of that, she ended up failing her American children. Yeah. I, and I really think the biggest part was it, it was her marriage because she was afraid of him. She didn't you know. She just came, she did make sure the house was clean, cooked and everybody was taken care of. And that's basically it. Because like I said, whenever she did try to do something extra, especially with the girls, he would say, you don't need to do that. You hanging around these other women who are independent feminist and all of this stuff but he wants her to be like this little kid under him yeah and i mean that's essentially he was i mean we in reading the synopsis we kind of knew that the dad was going to be abusive in some way and i don't think he hit them like in terms of what we saw in the story i don't think he laid a hand on them that you know would account towards abuse um he was mentally and emotionally abusive though. And I think that just kind of, and you know, I, we tried to at least give, give the group the warning beforehand that we thought this was coming and it totally did. But in saying that, I also feel like as somebody recently told me about a book club, book clubs aren't always about the comfortable conversations. And this might have just been a conversation that needed to come up at some point. Not that we, not that either of us support abuse in any way, because no reasonable person does. Um, but if you or somebody, you know, if you are in a relationship like this, or if you know somebody that is, let them know you're there for them. Let them know that you can help them. I mean, much like Rachel had somebody that could help her. Um, get help, find help. Um, you know, when you're in those relationships, call the police, um, therapists. There are so many people out there that can actually help get you through this stuff. Yeah, and it's so crazy because we just, our book last month dealt with mental health and mental abuse and all of that stuff. So, I mean, like I said, we did not know that it was going to be to this extinct of it. Like I said, none of this stuff, the synopsis was really vague. And so um, it opens up with the dad being like this. And, you know, even though Rachel had um, eventually got that family, Drew still didn't have that. And she felt left out and she felt, you know, even depressed for a moment. And she just, she had nobody. And so not only is it this mental abuse going on, it's depression as well. You know, everybody just basically isolating themselves based off really one person within the family. Yeah. And it's unfortunate. And, and a big part of the problem is, you know, when Rachel was dealing with her dad and having this happen, she was 16 and she was, four to six years older than her sister. And so Rachel got kicked out. That's how she got out and then got into her friend's family and got the support that she needed from them. And then got her mother who, you know, after she left kind of would sort of see her and talk to her, but especially started coming around after, you know, finding out that she's in a stable relationship and pregnant and she got pregnant real young too. Like she was 19. Yeah. The yeah. good news is, she was one of those rare teenage pregnancies where she and the guy worked together and were good for each other and actually stayed married. Not because they needed to be married and stay married, but because they wanted to be together forever. And 
according to the book, he'd even before she got pregnant had been like, I love you. I'll marry you one day. And then she gets pregnant and goes, oh, guess today is next week. Yeah. Because he stopped. And he stopped school. And so does she. Yeah. I knew she did. But yeah, he. But it, yeah. But I felt like they balanced each other out, especially her, because she needed. She was so impulsive and he was so calm and she needed that to balance her out. Well, and the weird thing is, while she was impulsive, she was also hyper-organized about everything. <laughs> like, it was a weird mix for her where she was impulsive. Like, she had these moments where, I mean, at least as a teenager, she was hyper-impulsive. And then she grew up, grew into, grew out of the impulsiveness, which I guess is normal, and into being very organized about things. And I feel like when you're like that, you just need somebody that's so much calmer than you are. <laughs> Yeah, it's because just sanity <laughs> is what it's based off of, basically. But overall, I I mean, even though I gave it, it gave it two stars and I have my reasons why. Overall, it's just a regular contemporary that, you know, it has a lot of trigger warnings within it. But um, it's not something that I would normally read. But like Lauren said, that's kind of what we try to do within this group pick something that we don't normally read because I would recommend a fantasy in a heartbeat. Oh, and she does every <laughs> month. But, um, you know, that's like, um, one of the goals of mine was to, you know, read out of my comfort zone, read more, um, adult novels or adult co contemporaries that I don't normally get into. And so, um, for me, this probably wasn't the best bridge from what I'm used to to try to navigate my way into that. But that's just me. Everybody's a different reader. So I really feel like if the other storyline wasn't in there and if the story was, you know, a bit more engaging, like, like if I didn't have to get into it within well over 50%, I probably would have given it maybe three, three and a half stars. But I'd also like to point out this is why Eric and I read together in terms of this because she and I are such different readers that – Every month we suggest very different things and we're trying to get each other out of our comfort zones. And we also are going to have very different viewpoints on the book. So if she hates something, I might like it. And if she likes something, I might not. And sometimes we meet and we're like, we both hated this or we both liked it. Yeah, we had a lot of those this year. <laughs> Unfortunately, this really wasn't a good year for Job and the Librarians with a lot of our books because most of them I liked, she hated, same vice versa. Or it's just we DNF'd it. Or because I think we had like what one or two of those. Well, I had two, you had I one. I, th I think I had one, but I will say this I'm not going to say it's a bad year for us if we had a lot of books that we disagreed on just because you know we we both realize that not everybody's going to read like either of us or both of us read and you're in coming to the show and listening to us disagree on the stuff you're or even agree on it you're going to get multiple viewpoints like even if we both like it or we both hate it we'll sit there and go okay I, we kind of sort of will see what they're trying to do in different parts or, and that's if we agree on it. If we don't agree on it, you're definitely going to get, like, very varied uh, views on it. Yeah. We try to be less critical with it, too. It's not, we don't bash the authors or anything, because we understand exactly what they went through for this. But it's just, like Lauren said, it's not really our cup of tea or <laughs> not. But it still wasn't an okay story. I mean, I I liked it. I will, will say that. But I didn't love it. And I didn't hate it. I will say this, though. One cool thing I found out in reading the book. Well, after reading the book. I did a little, very little research on Margaret Dilloway. And it turns out that she is Asian American. So, I, I mean, so. I don't know what she went through in her childhood and how autobiographical. Uh, autobiographical this book is so i'm not talking about any of that stuff what i think is cool is she had characters that at the very least were half asian american if not fully asian american 
and so on that level she's right it's almost an own voice type of thing where she's writing characters that she could have very well had similar experiences so it's not like eric and i were here writing about japanese american people or anything like that because like we don't know we didn't live the life no <laughs> yeah it's more authentic you know with her her writing i see her reading it but no well, I, I mean i would, I would hope she would write it before she published it i mean <laughs> Yeah, but I wouldn't even uh, attempt to do anything like that because I know absolutely nothing about Japanese history. I couldn't even pronounce these words, name of these characters in the story. So, no, that wasn't going to work. That's not I will work. say this. One good thing about the 12th century, ja ja uh, the 12th century Japan stuff in here is it did, I do want to learn more about Japanese history and Asian American history. Um, the only, or an Asian history in general, just because the only thing I've ever learned about Asia happened to be from a class I took at Ohio State during my undergrad because OSU required everybody to take a class that was a 570, it was either 579 or 597, one of those two numbers, but it basically came out to international issues. And each department had at least one one of these classes, and some of them had you know five ninety seven point one point two point three, and I ended up in the anthropology department, uh, taking their five ninety seven that was on or one of them it was like point three and it was on women culture and development, so it was about women in second and third world countries, so. China and I mean they literally were not looking at first world so no most of Europe was out of it Japan um America good chunk of South America because I mean a good chunk of South America has been developed like Brazil we didn't talk about Brazil um but I mean so we talked about Africa because that's what you tend to think about with third world anymore um talked about china and india and you know stuff like that um basically underdeveloped and developing countries and you know like when we we're talking about it in places like india and china getting pregnant outside of marriage is not okay like it's very much looked down upon to get an abortion in those countries is illegal it still exists but you the women that would come out of it would best case scenario would not be able to have kids anymore um and a lot of people die in it um on the flip side if you didn't have to go through that in these countries a lot of times you were forced to marry your rapist so oh, i mean wow. yeah and so that's the kind of stuff and so like as i'm reading this the part about because they at the end they're talking about their mother and getting information from their dad who they refuse to refer to as dad or father or anything like that they refer to him as his first name killian and so they're talking to him and they get information about their mother from it and it turns out the reason she had done had done this is she had a baby out of wedlock and the baby died young and so there's that aspect to it. like the kid died i want to say by the time it was two um maybe a few months like it had lived for a while and it had a pic there was a picture of this younger woman and her family and the baby and the that they had found and there was a name on it and when they asked her they go he goes no that woman's your mom and that's her baby and the i wouldn't have brought your mother over here if her if her baby was still in the picture and it turns out the baby was dead and she had changed her name in going to America. Like full on changed her name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All this just sounds so harsh and wrong on so many levels. So it's just crazy. It sounds harsh and wrong, but at the same time, it's how a lot of people lived. And even in this country, mail order brides. I mean, it I don't know if it still exists. I don't know if it still exists, but it definitely did at one point. Like people would, you know, women would want to get away from like the their families on the East Coast or have adventure. And so they would get 
you know, basically get signed up to do this stuff and be ordered to go out, you know, mail ordered to go out to say Montana, where it was just towns of men and they needed women. And they're like, Oh, I would like an adventure. And like, uh, basically that was happening in, at least in the movie, a couple of the movie versions of Jeanette Oaks, uh, love comes softly books. No, I had never heard of that. So I read this book. I don't know if I was just living on a rock or what, but I had never heard of it. I, yeah, I don't, I don't, well, I can't say never, because I was I would never do something like that, but you don't know one person's situation to do something like that, but that is a very, very big risk to take being a male or bride, I guess. Um, it is a risk, and there's part of me that wonders how much of, how much of it is, uh, how much of it is adventurism and how much of it is necessity and holy shit, this stuff still exists. Um, I'm sorry. I looked it up. It does. I looked it up on my phone. They're legitimately, please do not think of this as us endorsing this at all. Okay. This is us investigating because we just need to know. But what I found in my search, male order bride, male that is male slash dash order dash bride dot com stun and literally when like the blue part this title mail order bride stunning ladies from russia asia and latin america and then it goes into the descriptor mail order bride is a girl that creates an account on a special agency site and officially tells the world that she is looking for a partner from a partner as usual american if you are a man that is ready to find a bride and marry her this site is the most effective variant to make your plans and dreams come true Wow. wow. Meet single Russian women for marriage. And this is RussiaWoman.ca. Oh, God. This was a, you've got your, oh, God. One of the options is under 21. And you have 21 to 25, 26 to 30, 31 to 35, 36 to 40, and over 40 years old. How you, sure? said have, um, you said they have the option for under 21? Yep. The RussianWomen.ca. Oh, and the Daily Mail from the UK has confessions of the men who purchase married or mail order brides. Oh, God. Well, if they're under 21, I doubt it ends well. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I, yeah. I, I, okay. It, it still exists. It's good freaking God. I'm judging hard right now. I'm not even going to lie. Judging hard. Um, no. I mean, if you need that to get out of your situation, I'm not judging that. What I'm judging is this idea of an under 21. If you're under 21, what, what life decisions are you capable of making? Yeah. I mean, I was lucky to be like, this is where I want to go to college. Exactly. I, yeah. Oh my goodness. That does not end well. No. There's a lot of things going through my mind right now that I don't really know how to put that out there. You know, yeah. with this situation. Neither of us will be joining any of these sites. Like, I don't know. And it had to take me, never know when you read a book. Because I never knew that this existed, and I never knew that it still existed. It's just crazy. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't necessarily think it still existed. I knew it was a thing because, like I said, I knew there used to be orphan trains that crossed the country. Like when your parents, if you were an orphan and your parents died in say New York City, you could get it, or a lot of orphans to get them out of the city would be put on a train and sent across the country and were picked up by families. Um, and again, I knew that, you know, if you were a bride looking for like a woman looking for adventure or need to get out of crappy circumstances in again, New York City or Philadelphia or whatever, you could potentially put your name in like the personal ads or something and be or in a catalog and be ordered to go out west. Because, I mean, a lot of times it was, you know, you're in like Billings, Montana and there's nobody and you need to find a woman, but they're just not there. And I, I understand there's a very logical part of me that understands 
you know, the need to get out of a situation. And this might be your only way to do that. But there's also a part of me that's just. Uh, like yeah. it makes me crawl. But yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I can't understand it, but to each his own. Like, yeah. you, never, you never really know how significant a situation is until you're in their position. Yeah. And, like, you know, we're way over here, but the way it's ran over there, you may have to run, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Though I will say this, I know in, at least this year we've been tossing out. If you want a better version, or if you're interested in stuff, um, one of the books that I've been wanting to read that's got an Asian bent to it that's supposed to be really good is our William Golden. I think it's William Golden, but Memoirs of a Geisha. I've seen the movie. That movie's really good, and Macbeth handles essentially a story within a story. Really, well. not Macbeth, Hamlet, Shakespeare handles a story within a story really well because they have a part where they're doing a play within a play and how they do it is to try to get somebody to confess that they killed somebody. And so it's really interesting to see, see that. But let me see here. If I can find it. Memoirs of a Geisha. And do you have anything else that you would like to toss out as ideas? Um, well, something on a much lighter note. Um, I just watched Crazy Rich Asians. I hadn't read the book, but that one is pretty cool. I loved it. I do have the book on hold, so I can try to get to it. I have heard good things about both. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Memoirs of a Geisha by Arthur Golden. The movie of that is good. Um, and it looks like... Um, everybody that I know who's read Memoirs of a Geisha has given it very good re ratings on Goodreads, and they're, and granted, it's Goodreads, so, I mean, you've got, of course, with ratings, some people that have given it twos and threes, but, yeah, I mean, it looks like it's a bunch of fours and fives with a few threes and significantly smaller numbers of ones and twos on that. Um, it's like, what, <laughs> oh, go ahead. Like with this book, it had a couple of five star and four star. It had to me, I saw more five and four star than three and ones. I think I only saw one one star, a couple of twos, and a lot of threes. But more, I saw a lot of four and five. So maybe they all got something different out of it than I did. I don't know. You know, I'm not sure, and I I think you and I both got different things out of this as, as well. I mean, we got some of the same stuff, but we got different things, and we liked and hated different things. Yep. But yeah, I saw um memoirs of Geisha. I saw that it was it was it was good. A long time ago, but it was good. I agree. It's been a while since I've seen it. Um and as usual, uh whatever we mention as good ideas to I mean if you're interested in stuff that deals with you know asian americans or uh you know anything uh we're I'll, we'll send it to each other and try to get it into notes somewhere um but yeah i mean that's what we've been doing and i kind of like trying to do that for you guys just so that way you guys whether we like it or not at least know what's out there yeah, because everybody's writing style is different. And, you know, you may like something like this, something similar to if you didn't like this, I would still suggest to try it because everybody's writing style is different. Yeah, I mean, Maybe try it. I didn't really like her writing in a sense, but I will still, you know, try other things along this venue. Because, like I said, everybody writes different. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, for us, it's, as I, you said one time, it's, we're throwing stuff out there that is stuff we've either been interested in doing and as, so that way we've either write, read and liked that we 
are tossing your guys the audience's way and stuff that we've heard good things about that's also supposed to be good along you know what they're talking about but also um if we didn't like the book at least go here's who's doing it well so that way if it's something that you want to proceed with in the hopes that it's done well but also so that way if you know if however unlikely the author doesn't if the author sees this and is like what the hell is going on it's like look here's who else you could be looking at that also does this that you know, would hopefully inspire them and give them a level of all of this. Yep. I I am interested in reading um crap, what's the name of it? I can't think of it. It'll come to me though. I can't can think of it right now. But if I do I'll I'll put it in the description bar down below. Crap, I cannot remember the name of this story. It'll come to me. But um yeah. So the book for next month. What was the name of that one? Oh, it was a romance, yeah. isn't it? Uh, it's actually called the Romance Reader's Guide to Life. It is. Let me look it up for you. It's one of those books that I I recommended. Um, this month, Eric and I went back and forth a lot, in part because it was like. Yeah, you know, she suggests the one book that I liked that she suggested was supposed to be a suspense thriller. And it's been a, a little bit since, I mean, we've read a horror, we've read a little bit of mystery this year, but we haven't read something that's supposed to be straight up suspense. But her, the problem with that one book, it was, is that it was brand new this month, just published. And as library employees, we have trouble getting our hands on the books, you know, brand new, just because stuff's got to go to the patrons first. And um, add to that the fact that, you know, if our library doesn't have it or if your library doesn't have it, a lot of interlibrary loan agencies don't lend stuff that's under six months old. So we're like, well, we want to read this book. We just don't know if we or they can get their hands on it right now. So um, the other book that got tossed out that ended up having it, either both of us go, this looks good, is called The Romance Reader's Guide to Life. And it's called, as a young girl, Neve was often stuck in a world that didn't know what to do with her. As her mother not unkindly told her, she was never going to grow up to be a great beauty. Her glamorous sister, Lily, moved easily through the world, a parade of handsome men in pursuit. Her brother didn't want a girl joining his group of friends. And their small town of Lynn, Massachusetts, didn't have a place for a girl whose feelings were often put her at war with the world. Often this meant her mother, her brother, and the town librarian who wanted to keep her away from the dangerous books that she really wanted to read. But even though an unexpected friendship Neve finds herself with a forbidden copy of The Pirate Lover, A Steamy Romance, and Neve discovers a world of passion, love, and betrayal. And it is to this world that as she, as a grown-up, she retreats to again and again with when real life becomes too much. Neve finds herself rereading The Pirate Lover more than she ever did, never would have expected because as she gets older, life does not follow the romances she gobbled up as a child. When Lily and Neve are about to uh, realize their professional dream, Lily suddenly disappears. Neve must put down her beloved books and take center stage, something she has been running from her entire life. And she must figure out what to do, what happened to Lily. And if she's next, who Neve turns to help her make Sharon Pyle's The Read Romance Reader's Guide to Life, one of the most entertaining, original, exciting, and chilling novels you will ever read. So, I mean, the cool thing about this book is it's kind of a mix. So you've got a little bit of historical fiction because it's set older. And you've got mystery, romance, um, straight up fiction. So, I mean, it could be fun because we'll be getting a lot of stuff. And I'm sure 
Eric and I, at least according to the description, Eric and I will have a whole bunch to say about that librarian attempting to censor this kid from what she should and should not be reading. Yeah, it does sound really, it sounds interesting. Yeah. Nice little light coffee table read. Yeah. Well, and the nice thing is this book is a little over a year old. So we all should be able to get our hands on it as well. Yeah, so um, that's we just try to look out for you guys because I know a lot of people like me can't buy books all the time. It is um, on a budget, really. And you know, I, I've used a library now that I work there, but I use it all the time. So that's a good way. Like on my channel, yeah. I do a lot of library hauls as well. So yeah, and I try to use the library a lot. Um, and a good chunk of the time, if I'm recommending books and I happen to own it, like when I'm looking at my books, it's either I try to see what I can get from the library or I'm looking at the books that I own. Like I happen to have Sisters of Heart of Heart and Snow, and it was a book that I had owned. And I think I got it from a Goodreads. Um yeah, I got it from Goodreads, I'm pretty sure, where they had a giveaway, and I got it from that. The Reader's Romance, or the Romance Reader's Guide to Life, I happen to get as a pre-pub, as an ARC from my job, because they get sent to work all the time. So I get all sorts of adult-level books, because I happen to work as an adult reference person. And so they, um, so I grabbed that book, and I'm like, I have this, and it's a little older, so we can at least... Worst case, you know, worst case scenario, if everybody needs to get it through interlibrary loan, they should be able to. Yeah. Most of the time, like I said, I'm a young adult librarian, so most of the books that I recommend or get out there are YA because that's what I have to, you know, read to recommend to my teens that come in. But, yeah, we try to. And we're in. also trying to keep it, uh, you know, we're trying to keep, all, go, we essentially keep trying to play jump rope with that adult and YA line since we both work in very separate departments. We're like, hey, here's an interesting looking adult book. Do you want to read this this month? Here's an interesting looking YA book. Do you want to read this? And so we're trying to cross that line and we're trying to, like we all keep saying, we get outside of comfort zones, read different things. And I don't think we've read too many books where the main character is a reader, like a big reader. And so yeah yep well um we haven't decided on a date yet for next month um i'm not quite sure if it can be a tuesday next month uh let's see i know wednesday's not our normal day and we've got i mean it's just been a crazy crazy month um but once we figure out what the day is for next month we will announce it on facebook like we always do yeah yep so hopefully you guys get this book and we can all start it when sunday sunday is the first right i think so uh saturday is the first saturday is the first yeah so i'm excited to read this one i really think it's going to be a good book and i can't wait to start it get my hands on it and start it me too. It looks good and yeah. Yep. So I don't, do you have anything else you want to add about that? I don't the think so. Book? I don't either. Uh, let's see here. Have anything? Okay. No. Well, um, this was a good talk. We did have mm -hmm. different approaches with it, but I still enjoyed it a lot. So, um, we, as you know, we said um, previously, we'll let you all know when the show for next month will be. And we will see you all then. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.